you all for being here. My name is Penny Light, and I'm in charge of adult programs here, and many of you are familiar to us, but we have some new faces here, and we want to welcome you on. As many of you know, we have a lot going on here. Please take a newsletter on your way out, if you like. And we also have these calendars, one for May, one for June, plus lots of other materials, uh, more than you more than you could possibly need at your disposal. Um, we are here this evening because about a year ago, we got a request, a sort of a community use request uh, to have a talk about Social Security here, which wasn't exactly a library program. And the gentleman who's here this evening was the speaker, Bill Hino. And there, there were a number of people in the audience and I thought it was one of the best talks that I've ever heard, ever. So not to, not to um, build you up too much, Bill, but it was a great talk and it certainly seems like something that is useful to all of us, even though most of us look like we wouldn't be eligible to retire for <laughs> at least 20 years, but here we are. All right, um, Joyce Babcock at Wells Fargo uh, has been my contact person. It's been a pleasure to, to interact with her. All the folks at Wells Fargo are great. And actually, if you wanted any more Wells Fargo information, I think Joyce is in the back and has an email list if, you, if you'd like to be on it or information. Uh, Doug Culver will introduce our guest. Doug is the first vice president of Wells Fargo Advisors. He has been with the company for 26 years, almost as long as Bill Huno was with Social Security. <laughs> Um, he's been in Southampton for 17 years, and he's the resident branch manager. So, please welcome Doug Culver. Thank you very much, uh, Penny. I'm not used to uh, getting claps before I get up and speak. But thank you, and I'll see if I can live up to the, uh, to the applause. Um, I, just a few words about Bill. He was with Social Security for 27 years. He's been with us since uh, 2005. So before I take up any of his time, let me just introduce Bill. He's terrific. I think you'll love his presentation. So Bill. OK, thank you, Doug. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Can anybody tell me what that is a photograph of? OK, very good. It's uh, Franklin Roosevelt signed the first Social Security Act, August 14, 1935. A couple of good stories about this photograph. First of all, there are about two dozen versions of this photograph because every Democrat in Washington wanted a copy of that photograph with himself in it, preferably standing very close to FDR. All the versions of the photograph include the guy in the dark suit that's on Roosevelt's right shoulder. He was a man named Robert Wagner. Now, he's not the same Robert Wagner who was married to Natalie Wood, all right? Different Robert Wagner. But a famous guy nonetheless, he was really the most powerful man in Congress at that point. He was a senator from New York State. And if you ever heard of the Wagner Act, that's Wagner. The woman in the photograph was named Frances Perkins. Frances Perkins was the first woman to ever serve in the president's cabinet. She was FDR's Secretary of Labor. She holds a record to this day for the longest term of office in the presidential cabinet. And for all practical purposes, she is the author of that legislation that FDR is signing in that, in that photograph. See the guy standing behind Francis Perkins? Nobody knows who that is. <laughs> He's known at Social Security as being the mystery man. Social Security has a professional historian that's been doing this research about Social Security's history for, for decades, literally. And he's got some good theories about who this guy might have been, but he does not know for sure who that guy was. All they know for sure about that guy is he was not Waldo. <laughs> Although he was kind of like Waldo, when you say. So FDR signed that first Social Security Act uh, way back then, 1935, and it established retirement age here in the United States at age 65. Now, that was not without precedent. In fact, there were 33 Social Security systems set up in other countries around the world before we started ours here in 1935. 
Um, and most of those Social Security systems use 65 as a retirement age, but 65 was also the average life expectancy from birth in the United States in 1935. Now, life expectancy from birth does mean something different from life expectancy of people who live long enough to enter the workforce, but still, 65 was life expectancy, and 65 is what they chose as retirement age in 1935. A lot different today. I like this statistic. If a married couple makes it to age 65 today, they have an average joint life expectancy of an additional 26 years. And what that means is, a little oversimplified, but what it means is, married couple makes it to age 65, there's a 50-50 chance that one of them is going to live until their 90s. And gentlemen, I don't think I have to tell you <laughs> who that probably is not going to be. That's probably not going to be us. That's probably going to be our spouses, which is really an important point. Because in the normal course of events, when you have two members of a couple drawing Social Security, when the first one dies, the survivor gets the higher of their benefits. In other words, for example, for me, when I'm drawing Social Security, my wife's drawing Social Security, my benefit amount will be larger than hers. When I die, she survives me, which more than a normal couple, that's more li even more likely for us because she takes better care of herself than I do. Uh, but when she survives me, her benefit's going to go away, and she's going to get my benefit instead. If I improve my benefit by waiting longer to take my Social Security, it's going to improve what my widow gets after I die. If I reduce my benefit by taking the benefit early, it's going to reduce what my widow gets after I die. So guys, I think it's important for us to remember when we're making the decision about our Social Security, we're not only making a decision about how much we're going to get for the rest of our lives, we're probably also making a decision about what our widows are going to get after we pass away. So for many years, 65 was the retirement age for Social Security purposes here in the United States, for about 20 years. Then in the 1950s, Congress passed a law that said that women, but only women, could get their benefits at age 62. So for several years, it was true that women could get their benefits at age 62, but men had to wait till 65 to get their Social Security. That's the way it really, that continued for about 10 years. And then in the 1960s, Congress passed another law that said, okay, everybody can get their benefits at age 62 if they're willing to take a reduced rate, but if they wanted their full unreduced benefit, they had to wait until 65 to start drawing. So that really started the concept, early retirement, 62, normal retirement, or full retirement, 65, at least at first. Well, in the year 2000, the full retirement age, 65, started to increase. And over the last few years, that full retirement age has increased from 65 to 66. And over the next few years, it will increase from 66 to 67, as you can see on this slide. So, for example, my, I was born in 1953. I've got a full retirement age of 66. And what that means for me is, if I want my full unreduced benefit, I've got to wait till I'm 66 to start drawing. I can take my benefits at age 62, but it'll be at a reduced rate. I've got two brothers, one younger than me, one older than me. My little brother was born in 1963. He's got a full retirement age of 67. He can still get his benefits at age 62 at a reduced rate, but if he wants his full benefit, he's got to wait till 67 to start his Social Security benefit. So the minimum age to get benefits is not changing. That's still going to be 62 for the worker, still 62 for the spouse, still 60 for widows and widowers. Still 60 for widows and widowers. But the full retirement age is going up, eventually up to age 67. And that's as high as that full retirement age is going under the current rules. Now, of course, the first thing that the policy wants talk about, the first thing the politicians talk about when they talk about trying to fix Social Security's financial problems that they're going to encounter in the future is raising this full retirement age even higher than age 67. But under the current rules, that's as high as it goes. It doesn't go higher than 67. 
So what happens if I take my benefits before I start, before I reach full retirement age, which for me is 66? Well, in that case, there are little bitty increments of reduction that are taken away from my permanent Social Security benefit, little bitty increment of reduction for every month I take the benefit early. For example, if I start my benefit at age 65 plus 11 months, one month before my full retirement age, my benefit amount will be, for the rest of my life, 99.44% of what it would have been had I waited that one more month to start my Social Security. A little bitty bit of reduction for taking the benefit one month early. The little bits of reduction add up, though, as you can see on this slide. In fact, if I take my benefit the earliest possible time, at age 62, 48 months early, those little increments of reduction add up to a 25% reduction. And I'm going to get just 75% of what I could have drawn had I waited until 66 to start my Social Security. And for my little brother, if he takes his benefits at age 62, that's not just 48 months early for him, that's 60 months earlier than his full retirement age, and that's going to result in a 30% reduction in his benefit for taking the benefit at age 62. Don't try to do this math in your head. You can't. Because the little increments of reduction are two different sizes. So if you try to do the math in your head, well, if you look very, very carefully at this chart, the math on the chart doesn't look right. Well, the reason the math on the chart doesn't look right is the two increments of reduction are two different sizes. So you can't do the math in your head. You have to use a very complicated formula, a five-step formula, or you just have a cheat sheet on your desk like I do that tells you this, uh, this many years, this many months early, this is what the person gets for taking the benefits that many uh, months early. So let's say I didn't take, oh, well, the important thing about the reduction, though, I almost forgot to mention this, or emphasize this, the important thing about this reduction is it's permanent. So if I really uh, get 48 checks before I turn 66, my first Social Security check will be for 75%. My last Social Security check will be for 75%. And even more importantly, because I reduce my benefit, it reduces what my widow gets after I pass away. So let's say I don't take the benefits early. In fact, I don't even take them at full retirement age. I wait beyond full retirement age to take my Social Security. What happens then? Well, in that case, there are little bitty increments of increase that are added to my Social Security benefit. For every month, I delay taking Social Security, even though I've attained my full retirement age. And these little bits of increase are a little bit for every month. It's two-thirds of 1% for every month. I delay taking my Social Security, even though I've attained my full retirement age. Two-thirds of 1% per month adds up to 8% per year. So if I wait till I'm 67 to take my Social Security, for example, my benefit amount will be 108% of what I could have received had I started my benefit right at age 66. 8% more for the rest of my life because I gave up a year of benefits. And if I want to maximize what I get from Social Security for the rest of my life and also maximize what my widow gets after my death, I would wait until I was 70 to start my Social Security. I get four years worth of those 8% per year increases for a whopping 132% of my full benefit. The increase in your benefit for waiting until 70 is eye popping. It's a dramatic increase in your benefit. But you've given up a lot to get that 132%. You know, potentially you've given up eight years of benefits you could have received get that 132% uh, amount. Um, so there's pros and cons for that. I'll talk more about that a little bit later. But the biggest pro for the argument, wait till 70, for a man, I believe, is because you're going to be leaving a better benefit for your widow after you pass away. I need to warn you about something. Some of the stuff I tell you this evening might not necessarily be a fact. It might just be my opinion. And I try to remember to tell you this is my opinion, not necessarily a fact. When I am giving you just my opinion, I'll try to remember to do that. But here's a fact, not an opinion. No one, under any circumstances, should wait beyond age 70 to start his or her Social Security benefits. The benefits do not increase because you're waiting beyond age 70. So I, there's no purpose in me waiting beyond age 70. I can't get any more than that 132% rate. 
There's no purpose in my younger brother waiting beyond age 70. He can't get any more than that 124% rate because there's only three years difference between his full retirement age, 67, and age 70. The highest possible benefit he can get and the highest possible possible benefit he can leave for his widow after his death is just 124% of his full benefit. The other reason why we need to know about full retirement age has to do with this rule. There's a rule that limits our on-the-job earnings while we're younger than full retirement age. Once we reach full retirement age, no limit. So when I turn 66, it doesn't matter how hard I'm working, it doesn't matter how much money I'm making on the job. The month I turn 66, I can draw all my Social Security benefits no matter what. But if I want to receive Social Security benefits while I'm younger than 66, that is a limit on my earned income, a limit on my on-the-job earnings. That limit this year is just $14,640. That's all that somebody who's 62, 63, 64, 65 years old, widows or widowers, 61, 62, uh, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65 years old. That's all they can earn on the job and still expect to receive all of their Social Security benefits. If you earn above that amount, again, while you're younger than full retirement age, you lose a dollar from your Social Security for every two dollars you earn in excess of the $14,640 limit. So go over the limit, but not too much over the limit, you'll still get some of your Social Security. But if you're way over the limit, and if you're working full-time at an above-average salary, this one for two deduction that they take away from your Social Security will completely wipe out your Social Security eligibility. You won't get any Social Security benefits until you cut back on your work activity or until you turn full retirement age. Because remember, once we turn full retirement age, no limit. We can work as much as we want to, still receive all of our Social Security once we've reached full retirement age. Now, it's really not so important to remember $14,640. Okay, sometimes I can't remember that. Not a big problem, though, because that number changes almost every year. But it is very important that we remember exactly what income counts against that limit. Think about this limit as being a limit on your work activity. It's not really a limit on your income, but a limit on your work activity. So the only income that counts against Social Security's earnings limit is money you're working for during the current year. So if you're an employee, it's your gross wages from your W-2 form. The highest amount that shows up in your W-2, and the highest amount will show up either in Box 1, Box 3, or Box 5 of your W-2. That's what Social Security is going to be looking for. If you're self-employed, you don't get a W-2. If you're a sole proprietor or general partner or you're a one-person LLC, you don't have a W-2 form. You have a Schedule SE in your tax return instead, and that's what Social Security is going to look at, your net profit from your Schedule SE. No other income would indicate that you're still working. Therefore, no other income counts against Social Security's earnings limits. So here's some examples of income that does not count against the limit. What? Interest? Had a mind right there. Had a recurring moment there. Sorry about that. Interest, dividends, capital gains, real estate rents, and other investment income do not count against Social Security's earnings limits. None of this income counts against the limit either. Pensions and annuities don't count against the limit. Distributions of deferred compensation like money we're taking out of a 401k plan, do not count against the limit. Money you take out of your IRA does not count against your limit. Of course, the money you're taking out of your 401k plan, the money you're taking out of your IRA, you work for that money, that's for sure. But you worked for it in the past. You didn't work for it during the current year. It's not going to show up in a W-2 form. Therefore, it does not count against Social Security's earnings limit. So the money you're pulling out of your retirement nest egg does not count against the limit. Your mailbox income does not count against the limit. It's just the fruits of your labor during the current year, the money you work for in the current year, your W-2 wages, or your net profit from self-employment, they'll count against that Social Security earnings limit. Don't get the earnings limit mixed up with a totally different rule, the rule that says you have to pay income tax on your Social Security benefits. 
Now, the earnings limit's all we talked about so far. We haven't talked about income taxation yet. So let's compare and contrast these two rules. First of all, the earnings limit determines when we can receive Social Security, how much they're willing to send us, and how much of those benefits we can keep, that we don't have to pay back to the Social Security Administration. That rule ends when we turn full retirement age. Once I'm 66 years old, it doesn't matter how much I'm working, I can receive all my Social Security benefits at that point. Well, the taxation of my Social Security benefits goes on for the rest of my life. No matter how old I get, I'm going to be paying income tax on my Social Security benefits. If you don't have the earnings limit, remember it's only our earned income that counts against the limit. These are all on-the-job earnings count against the earnings limit. For the taxation of Social Security benefits, it's all of our income that counts in the threshold in the income test that determines how much of our Social Security benefits will end up being taxable. Uh, the IRS calls that definition, definition of income provisional income. And provisional income includes, well, everything that's on page one of our Form 1040. Think about what your Form 1040 looks like. Well, everything's already on there. Everything the IRS can think of is on your first page of your Form 1040. You add to that one half of your Social Security benefits. You add to that any tax-exempt interest you received from your muni bonds. All that income together is called provisional income. And the higher that income is, the higher the percentage of your Social Security benefits will end up being taxable. The math is totally different for the two rules. For the earnings limit, remember, $14,160 is the limit. I'm sorry, $14,600. See, I told you I couldn't remember the, the, the number. $14,640 is the number this year. And you go over that number, dollar taken away from your benefits, for every $2 you earn in excess of that limit. For the taxation of the Social Security, well, if your income is below $25,000 a year for a single person, or below $32,000 a year for a married couple, you'll get your Social Security benefits tax-free. But if your income is above those amounts, then some of your benefits will be taxable. It starts off slowly, so if just a few dollars of your, uh, you're just a few dollars over the $25,000, or over the $32,000 between you and your spouse, just a few dollars of your benefits will end up being taxable. But if your income is high enough, 85% of your Social Security benefits will end up being taxable. And a good guess that probably half of us in this room, 85% of our benefits will be taxable. And the other half of us in the room, we're going to be somewhere in that sliding scale between no taxability and 85% of our benefits being taxable. And it's on an infinitely variable sliding scale. The higher your income is, the higher the percentage of your benefits will end up being taxable. Another important difference between these two rules is that for the earnings limit, each individual is looked at separately. Even if you file a joint return with your spouse, as far as this earnings limit is concerned, you're looked at separately from your spouse. But when you think about it, if Social Security is looking at our W-2 to look for our wages, well, even if we file joint tax returns with our spouse, our W-2 form has just one Social Security number on it, just the Social Security number of the worker. And again, we're looked at separately as far as this rule is concerned. But what that means for me is that when I turn 62, I'm free to quit work and apply for my Social Security, even if my wife is still working and has lots of earned income. At least as far as Social Security is concerned, I can do that. As far as my wife's concerned, well, I'm not so sure about that, but as far as Social Security is concerned, I can retire, draw my Social Security, even if she has lots of W-2 income. Speaking of my wife, let's talk a little bit about the benefits that Social Security pays to spouses. Now, these benefits are paid to both men and women. When I talk about these benefits, I'm going to talk more about women drawing the benefit, a wife drawing the benefit based on her husband's Social Security, but it, just because it's easier for you to keep track of what I'm talking about, but you can translate that into meaning that a husband can get this benefit also. In fact, the program I did earlier today, there was a husband that will, who will be getting husband's benefits based on his wife's Social Security. So it does work both ways. I'll just use it as an example, my wife, who is a woman. Um, so take my wife, please. 
My plan A for my retirement is I am going to quit work when I'm 62 and apply for my Social Security benefits right then at 62. My wife is three years younger than I am, and it's her plan A when she turns 62 to apply for her Social Security benefits right at age 62. When she does, here's what will happen to my wife at the local Social Security office. First of all, they'll figure out what she can get if she got a benefit based on her own work activity, based on what she paid into Social Security during her working lifetime. Second, they will figure out what she can get if she got a benefit based on half of my Social Security, and they'll pay her whichever benefit is greater. If her own benefit's higher, she gets her own benefit. If her own benefit's lower, there's a safety net there for her. She knows she'll at least be able to get that benefit based on half of my Social Security. So I'm drawing Social Security, and my wife is drawing Social Security. Three months later, in that same year, my ex-wife will turn 62, and she will apply for her Social Security benefits. I know what you're probably thinking here. Ex-wife, how could that be? Why would some, someone divorce this man? Part of that. <laughs> Sad but true. My ex-wife and I were married for more than 10 years, which is one of the extra requirements she must meet to get benefits as an ex-wife. 10-year duration of marriage requirement. My ex-wife is not married to anybody else. That's the other extra requirement she must meet to get benefits as an ex-wife. Because she meets those two extra requirements, she is treated exactly as my wife is treated, treated by Social Security. They figure out what my ex can get based on her own work history. They figure out what she can get based on half of my Social Security. And she gets whichever benefit is greater, whichever amount is greater. It's not going to matter that there could be two women drawing Social Security on one husband's Social Security record. They both get that benefit. They do not have to share it. That matter that one's the wife and one's the ex-wife, my ex-wife meets the two extra requirements, therefore she's treated exactly as my wife is treated. It also doesn't matter who suffered longer in the jury. <laughs> so now I'm drawing Social Security, my wife is drawing Social Security, my <coughs> ex-wife is drawing Social Security, and I die. Hopefully that's many years later, but I am going to die, and it's very likely that both of those women will survive me. What happens then? They're both going to get what I was getting at the time of my death. They'll both get that whole benefit. Not half of it. They're both going to get that. They don't have to share it. They're, both, they're each going to get that benefit amount. Doesn't matter once the widow, once the surviving ex-wife, they'll be treated exactly the same way. Um, doesn't matter which one was married me longer in material, they're both going to get that, that same benefit. I took applications from three women on one guy's Social Security record. When I first started work for the government back in the 1970s, I lived in the Boot Hill of Missouri. You know the part of Missouri that sticks into Arkansas? You can kind of envision that the, on the map? Well, I lived in a little town down in the Boot Hill of Missouri, and a guy died in a little town, and three women showed up to apply for survivor benefits on this one guy's Social Security uh, work history. The first woman was his widow. We had been married to it for at least nine months. That's the requirement for widow, nine month duration of marriage requirement. Um, the other two women were ex-wives who had been married to it for at least 10 years apiece. All three of these women were over age 60. All three of these women got what that guy was getting at the time of his death. Didn't have to share it. They all three got what he was getting. He's the guy that got his money's worth from Social Security. He's the guy. Now, sometimes when I tell this story, people get a wrong impression. I want to make, I'm going to kind of um, make sure that this is perfectly clear, kind of shortcut any misunderstanding. It's not necessary for me to have started my Social Security for my survivors to get Social Security based on my Social Security record. Not necessary for that to happen. My dad died well before my mom was Social Security age. He died when she was... Early, 19, early 50s. Well, years later, when she turned 60, she applied for widow's benefits, and she was able to get widow's benefits at that point. Now, had my dad started his Social Security before his death, that would have influenced what she would have gotten from Social Security, but because he never started Social Security, my mom got a Social Security widow's benefit 
based on what he would have gotten had he lived to full retirement age, um, and she got a benefit based on that. Now I'm going to tell you about a rule, a very important rule, and I'll immediately tell you about an exception to that rule, and then a little bit later in my presentation I'll tell you about another exception to the rule. So here's the rule. There's a rule that says that for a wife to get Social Security benefits based on her husband's Social Security record, the husband's got to be getting benefits himself or has got to be deceased, of course, one or the other. So, by the time my wife turns age 62, if I'm not drawing Social Security by that time or I'm not deceased by that time, my wife's not going to be able to get any Social Security based on my Social Security record. The only benefit she's going to be eligible for, at least at first, is her own Social Security retirement benefit. The benefit she earned herself paying into Social Security through her own work activity. All right, now later on, you know, she could reapply for benefits. Once I did start drawing Social Security, she could reapply and get that benefit as my spouse. But she can't get the benefit as my spouse until I'm drawing benefits myself. Here's an exception to that rule. There's an exception for ex-wives. Ex-wives <laughs> do not have to wait until their ex-husbands are drawing Social Security benefits to get the benefits as an ex-wife. They can be what are called independently entitled divorced spouses. Independently entitled divorced spouses. Now, they have to meet all the normal requirements, of course. They've got to be 62. They have to win married to their ex-husbands for at least 10 years. They have to be unmarried. They can't be married to somebody else and be considered an ex-wife for Social Security purposes. In addition to all the normal requirements, well, and the husband's got to be at least age 62. He doesn't have to be drawing benefits, and he can be working and making lots of money in material, but that ex-husband must be at least age 62. In addition to that, the divorce must be at least two years in the past. And I guess the purpose of that is to keep people from divorcing right at 62 to take advantage of that rule. But the divorce must be at least, at least two years ago. And if all those requirements are met, then the ex-wife can get benefits as an ex-wife, even if her ex-husband is still working, making lots of money, and not drawing his Social Security benefits. So think about this for a second. My wife and my ex-wife turn 62. I am not yet drawing Social Security benefits. My wife cannot get that spousal benefit but my ex-wife can. So think about the potential for marital discord in that, in that story. Okay, now I'll tell you about another exception to that rule in a, in a, in a few minutes, a couple of minutes. All right, we're going to do a little survey here. This will be a multiple choice survey, and your choices will be take your Social Security benefits as soon as you can get them, or wait until full retirement age to get your full unreduced benefit, or Wait till age 70 to start your Social Security so you get the highest possible benefit and gentlemanly the highest possible benefit for our widows after we pass away. So here's a survey. How many people say take the Social Security as soon as you can get the benefits? Okay, good. And how many people say no, wait till your full retirement age, get the full unreduced amount? Okay, good. And how many people say no, wait till you're 70, get the highest possible amount, and leave the best benefit for your widow after you pass away, gentlemen? Okay, very good, excellent. Good participation. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. There is one and only one correct answer to the question, when should I start drawing my Social Security benefits? What is the one and only one correct answer to that question? It depends. It depends. And what does it depend on? How long do you think you're going to live? How long do you think your spouse is going to live? Uh, if you're under full retirement age, whether you're still working, how much money you're earning on the job. Health insurance is a big factor. Sometimes health insurance is the trump card in this little game because you're not going to get Medicare until you turn 65. Your spouse is not going to get Medicare until he or she turns 65. If you don't have other health insurance to tie you both over until you turn 65, well, that might be keeping you in the workforce longer, keeping you off of Social Security longer than you otherwise would be. So no matter what I'm about to tell you for the next 90 seconds or so, there is one and only one correct answer to the question, when should I start drawing my Social Security? And that answer is, it depends. Well, having said that, I've got a confession. 
I am highly biased toward people taking Social Security as soon as they can get the benefits. Now, here's my case for doing that. Well, remember, <laughs> the only correct answer is it depends. First of all, the 12-year rule. As a rule of thumb, if you delay taking your Social Security benefits to get a higher benefit later on, you've got to draw that higher benefit for at least 12 years before you made up for the money you could have taken but did not take while you were waiting to get that higher benefit amount. So if you're comparing 62 versus 66, for example, well, if you wait till 66 to draw your benefit, you'll draw a higher amount for the rest of your life, but you're going to have to draw that higher amount for 12 years till you're 78 years old before you made up for the money you could have received between 62 and 66. That 12 years is at least 12 years. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's much longer than 12 years. Uh, if you're looking at 66 versus 70, 12 and a half years. You've got to draw the age 70 benefit to your 82 and a half. We make up for the money you could have received but did not take. If you're a widow, well, reduced widow's benefits as early as age 60. Full widow's benefits usually at age 66. Well, you wait till 66 to get the full widow's benefit. The catch-up time is 15 years. If you're 81, you got to draw that benefit for you made up for the money you could have received prior to age 66. I was working on a case earlier today. The catch-up time for the guy, the client I was working with, 18 years beyond age, uh, beyond age 70. If this guy hadn't taken my recommendation to take the benefits when he did, well, he would have been had to draw that higher benefit till he was 88 years old for he made up for the money he could have received but did not take. But 12 years is a safe statement. It'll take at least 12 years of drawing the higher Social Security retirement benefit uh, to make up for the money you could have received but did not take way to get that higher benefit amount. The 12 years does not include the time value of the money. In other words, it doesn't include the interest you would earn on the money if you took it and settled it and the government hold on to it. Just, that's just a number of dollars that Social Security is sending you. 12 years is the rule for that. That also doesn't include what I call the fun value of the money. And here's what I mean by that. Next time you're at a family gathering, look around at your relatives. Who's look, who looks like they're having more fun with their money? The people in their 60s and 70s or the people in their 80s and 90s? Unless your family is a whole lot different than mine, the people in their 60s and 70s are much more likely to be still traveling, boating, golfing, all those things that take up more energy, better health, and more money, as opposed to the folks in their 80s and 90s. Now, I'm not saying I'm giving up in my 80s or 90s, and so I'm going to have as much fun as I can, but I, don't, I expect to have more fun with my money earlier in my retirement as opposed to later in my retirement. So sometimes it's not just the number of dollars that we're getting, that we're receiving from the government, Sometimes it's a matter of lifestyle or having pleasure in life. I think that's a, maybe a more important uh, consideration. I know it's not question time, but isn't that just for people who aren't working? Well, one of the fa factors is you don't you have to consider if you're under full retirement age whether you are still working and have um, you know and you're work making too much money to receive Social Security benefits. Uh, if you're at least full retirement age, your work activity is practically immaterial, unless because of your work activity you're going to be in a much lower tax bracket than you are after retirement than you are before retirement. For most retirees, that's not the case, though. A lot of retirees think intuitively they're going to be in a lower tax bracket after retirement. That's not always the case. You need to rather really look at your tax bracket and, uh, and make that decision. But yeah, generally, if you're at least 66, full retirement age, the work activity is immaterial at that point. And you had a question earlier. I did. Yeah. Uh, my question is if the wife is older than the husband, but they are now both getting Social Security, each of them after 62. Okay. Uh, and the wife's receiving the Social Security at a lower rate. And the husband passes away? No, the husband doesn't pass away. Okay. But her Social Security is remaining at the lower level. 
Okay, so she applied for benefits at first. Yes. And then he was not he was not eligible for benefits at that point. Right. So she, all, the only benefit she was eligible for was her own Social Security. Right. Then later on, he applied for benefits. Well, at that point, she should have checked at that point when he applied for benefits to see if she could get a better benefit on his Social Security, and then she could have applied for the spousal benefit at that point. So if this is, if this is a real-life case, you need to go back to Social Security and can check to see. Can you go back is my question. Can you get any back pay? Can you go back? Can you go can you return to the Social Security office? Yeah. Sure. I mean that that can't be your question though, could it? Well they change it. <laughs> no. Well they change it. Well yeah, they, they they will change it. They won't change it retroactively, but oh. they'll change it, you know, they'll change it presently right. and prospectively, you know, looking forward, but they won't change it uh, retroactively. Okay. Right. So you need to go back and check on that to see if you can get a higher benefit now based on half of your husband's uh, social security. Right. And they'll check on that for you. Okay. You're welcome. All right. Let's talk about a couple of advanced strategies in applying for Social Security benefits. Now, there are actually about a half a dozen of these strategies, but I'm going to talk to you about my two favorite strategies. Uh, but bear in mind, there are several, several of these. Uh, the first strategy is the other exception to that rule that I told you about, where the husband's got to be getting Social Security for the wife to get Social Security benefits based on his Social Security record. Remember I told you about that rule, how uh, there's an exception for ex-wives, but the wife can't get Social Security unless her husband is drawing benefits or unless he's deceased. Well, here's the other exception to that rule. Here's the other exception to the rule. The other exception is called file and suspend. And my brother, my older brother, is actually going to use this particular strategy for his Social Security. And the way it works is like this. My brother wants his age 70 benefit, so he doesn't agree with my bias for taking the benefits as soon as you can get them. He wants his age 70 benefit. He wants to leave the age 70 benefit for his widow after he passes away. Well, there's an extra problem with my brother waiting until he's 70 to start his Social Security. His wife has no Social Security work history whatsoever, and she can't qualify for any Social Security benefits based on her own work activity. She's a year older than he is. If he, if he does actually wait till 70 to apply for Social Security, she's not going to get any Social Security benefits until, until he turns 70. She'll be waiting for benefits also. Well, my brother knows about this exception, and he's going to take advantage of this. This exception is called file and suspend. He's going to do this at age 66. He can't do this before 66. 66 is the earliest he can do it. Well, I have to know when my brother turns 66, he and his wife will go to the local Social Security office, they'll transact three pieces of business, boom, 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 all in the same day. First piece of business is my brother applies for his age 66 Social Security benefit. Second piece of business is his wife applies for the spousal benefit. Now, in, her, in their case, she will get exactly half of his Social Security. She's here older than he is, so there won't be any reduction because she's under 66, she'll get precisely half of his Social Security. Third step is, he will immediately voluntarily suspend his own Social Security checks. So even though he's applied for them, even though he wants them to send benefits to his wife, he doesn't want any checks for himself. He's going to leave his checks in suspense until he turns 70. When he turns 70, he's going to go back into the Social Security office and he will tell them, in the words of the great Nick Jagger, start me up. And they'll start up his benefits at age 70. Because he didn't start his benefits until 70, he's going to get his 132% rate. He's going to leave his 132% rate for his widow after he passes away. And in the meantime, between his 66th birthday and his 70th birthday, his wife will have received 48 Social Security checks that she otherwise would not have received. And because my brother's always been very highly compensated, those 48 checks will add up to about $64,000 that my sister-in-law will get that she otherwise would not have received. Now again, this is called file and suspend. It'd be pretty cool if my brother could do this before he turned 66, but he cannot. You cannot voluntarily suspend your Social Security checks if you've applied for them. You can't voluntarily suspend them if you're young, younger than full retirement. 
she does not. She stays right. The benefit for the wife is invariably 50% of the husband's social security, full social security, his age 66 amount, subject to reduction for her age. And that's true whether he took his benefit at 62, whether he took his benefit at 70, or anywhere in between. It's not doesn't matter. When you figure out what his wife can get based on his social security, you're starting with his full benefit, his age 66 amount, half of that is her full amount, and then fit, uh, you reduce that if she's taking the benefit early. So yeah, she doesn't get it step up in, in benefits. But that's what makes this file, that's one of the reasons why this file is spent is so good. You know, her benefit does not increase beyond her 66th birthday. So there's no point in her waiting until at least, like in my, in my example, um, no point in my sister-in-law waiting until my brother's 70 to draw his social security because her benefit's not growing during that time. His benefit would be growing, of course, but her benefit's not growing. So they need to do this file and suspend no later than when she turns 66, and the optimal time is really when he <coughs> turns 66 is when they would, uh, when, when they would do it. Yes, Is the criteria that the woman did not work? I mean, what Not necessarily. Oh, okay. but, it, but she would, in this, in this situation, this works if the wife's benefit is lower than, uh, lower than uh, half of the husband's social security. Yeah. Or, this the would other, make, or the other way around. Or the other way around. There's no gender language in the social security rules whatsoever. I could have made up this. I could have made up an example that was uh, where the wife would work. The husband would always stay home, taking care of the family, and uh, the wife wanted the husband to get social security based on his social, her social security record. We get a switch to genders exactly, and it would work the same way. Yeah, there's no gender language in the social security rules uh, whatsoever. All right, this is my plan B for my retirement. Plan B for my retirement is this. Well, plan A, remember, is I take my benefit at age 62. Well, plan B is I don't retire when I'm 62. I'm still working, making too much money at 62 to uh, get any Social Security. Four years later, I'm 66. At that point, it doesn't matter whether I'm working or not. I can draw Social Security at 66 no matter what I'm doing. When I turn 66, my wife will be 63. She will be drawing Social Security benefits at that point. Well, I'll have an option. If I haven't taken any Social Security before I turn 66, I'll have the option of applying for my own Social Security benefit or applying for benefits based on half of my wife's Social Security. My benefit, of course, would be higher, but I would take the benefit based on half of my wife's Social Security. I would draw just that benefit until I turn 70. And at 70, I will go back into Social Security, apply for my own Social Security benefit. If I didn't touch any of my own checks until I turn 70, I'll get my 132% rate. I'll leave the 132% for my widow after I die. And in the meantime, between 66 and 70, I will have received quite a bit of Social Security benefits. Not as much as I would have gotten, and I just started my benefit right away, but a pretty significant amount of money, free money, basically, because I'm going to get all those benefits, those 48 checks, and I'm still going to get the highest possible benefit that I can get based on my work history, leave the highest possible benefit that I can leave for my widow, again, based on my work history. That's called claim now, claim more later. Claim now, claim more later. I wish I could do this before I turn 66, but I can't. If I apply for my Social Security before full retirement age, I don't have an option. If I apply for benefits before full retirement age and my wife's drawing Social Security, they will force me to take the higher of the two benefits, my own benefit. It's only if I defer <coughs> any Social Security until I turn 66 that they'll give me the option of applying for benefits just as a husband and let my own benefit grow until I turn uh, age 70. And by the way, they've revised the Social Security applications now and if you're applying for Social Security at 66 or later currently, there's an option on there in writing. Would you prefer to take the benefit based on half of your spouse's Social Security and let your own benefit grow until 70? It's something that people at Social Security know about, uh, so it's you know an option they should be presenting to you if you're applying if you're deferring all benefits until full retirement age. That is an option, uh, an option for you. Now, I do want to talk about the five points I wish everyone knew about Medicare, that will take five minutes, 
but let me take just a couple of questions real quick before I, before I do that. And I have, I'm going to tell you something. Don't worry if I don't get your question answered in front of everyone. I will answer every question in this room before I leave this evening. You'll get your question answered. But I'm not going to have everybody wait around and listen to every question. You know, at some point we'll stop, just come up to me individually, happy to answer those individual questions. As a matter of fact, if you have questions after I leave, that's fine. Contact well, your Wells Fargo advisor. He or she can find me, and we'll get those uh, other questions answered too. Yes, ma'am. What if you have never been married, you married late in life? How many years do you have to be married? Okay, very good. The 10-year duration of marriage requirement is for an ex-wife, not for a wife. So actually, the duration of marriage requirement for a wife is 12 months. However, there are eight exceptions to that rule that allow wives, or husbands for that matter, it's gender neutral, all the gender neutral, a lot of wives to get benefits before that 12 months is up. So I have to tell you, I've been doing this for a long time, 34 years now, and I have never seen a situation where we had two older people get married where the wife had to wait 12, assuming she was old enough, you know, she's got to be 62, of course, assuming she was old enough, really had to wait that whole 12 months to start those spousal benefits. Almost always they meet one of the exceptions where they don't have to wait even the 12 months to get the benefit. Duration of marriage requirement for a widow, I mentioned it, nine months for will. Ten years for ex-wives, nine months for widow, 12 months for wives, but a lot of times they don't have to wait the 12 months. So if a 70-year-old woman marries an 85-year-old man, they have to be married one year? Okay, almost certainly they have to be married zero years. Almost certainly she'd be able to get the benefit right away. Was she ever married to somebody before? No. Oh, she was never married before? No. Okay, well, she probably would have to wait the 12 months. One year. Twelve months. Yes. <laughs> Twelve months. Let's stick with that. Twelve months. Just Twelve months. Yeah. 365 days. And those eight exceptions, you'll tell me what they are later? Well, if she was never married to anybody else, she had to meet the exception. So this will be the first time in my 34-year career that I've encountered someone that didn't meet, didn't meet that exception. She was never married before. No. All right. Okay. Well, yeah, she had to meet the exception. She had to wait the 12 months. And she's in marriage for at least 365 days, yes. Yeah. Or 366 if it's a if this will be you. Okay, one more quick question. Okay, I already answered asked who had a question for you. Somebody has an had a question? Yes, thank you. Very basic question. All right. A couple months ahead of time. Yeah, a couple months ahead of time. They're gonna ask for your birth certificate. Uh, they might ask for other stuff too, but at least your birth certificate they'll have to they'll have to ask for that. I recommend you call ahead and make an appointment. If you make an appointment uh, ahead of time, you can call them at their 800 number, 1-800-772-1213, and uh, make an appointment at your local office, 1-800-772-1213, and then uh, apply for benefits um, Apply for benefits in the local office. All right. The five points I wish everyone knew about Medicare, point number one is you've got to be 65 for Medicare. I already mentioned that. Each individual's got to be 65. The only exceptions are on account of disability. If you're unlucky, you might have Medicare before 65 on account of disability. If you're lucky, you'll have Medicare <coughs> under 65. Medicare is different from Medicaid. Medicaid is totally different. <coughs> Medicaid has an income limit and an asset limit, and those limits are very low. <coughs> Hopefully no one in this room will ever qualify for Medicaid because that would mean that your assets have dwindled to your house plus $2,000. In most states and most situations, that's the asset limit for Medicaid. Medicare, no asset limit for Medicare, no income limit for Medicare. Warren Buffett is on Medicare. So obviously there are no asset limits or income limits for Medicare. Medicare does not cover long-term care. There's a still nursing benefit in Medicare, but it does not cover long-term care. It covers just short-term care, and it covers it just under certain restricted circumstances, very restricted circumstances. No kind of Medicare to help you pay your nursing home bill or for other long-term care expenses. It does not. Medicare is not enough health insurance for you. You're going to need something to supplement your Medicare coverage. 
The Medicare uh, program has lots of deductibles, lots of co-payments, but lots of services Medicare just does not cover at all. For example, if services outside the country. They're outside the United States, your Medicare is not good outside the United States. So you need something else to fill in the gaps of your Medicare coverage. We don't sell any kind of Medicare supplement, but we are happy to give you advice about uh, Medicare supplements. If you have questions about what kind of supplement you ought to be in, contact your Wells Fargo advisor. He or she will find me, and we'll get those questions answered for you about the Medicare supplements. Medicare is a very complex program. Uh, there are four parts of Medicare, and every one of them is more complex than the previous one. The most complex program, in my opinion, really the most complex government program on earth, in my opinion, is Medicare Part D, the drug part of Medicare. Yes. There are so many variables involved in Part D of Medicare, it is impossible for a human brain to choose a Medicare drug plan. However, it is not impossible for a computer to do that. And fortunately, there's a computer on Medicare's web, uh, computer program on Medicare's website that does exactly that. You go onto this computer program on Medicare.gov, you punch in the drugs the patient takes, you punch in their zip code, punch the button on your computer, and it tells you which of the three dozen plans in this area is the most economical plan for that patient based on the drugs they're currently taking. So using that tool, it is very easy to choose a Medicare drug plan, and it's so easy. Once you've been through it one time, you will be an expert. You can amaze your friends and help them choose a Medicare drug plan. Once you've been through it once, you're an expert. The hardest part about the process is spelling the drug names. Once you got that done, you got it. You got it made. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop now. And I remember I want you to remember though. If you have individual questions, please come up to me individually. I'm happy to answer those individual questions. I will not leave this room until I've answered every question in the room. If you have other questions after we leave tonight, call your Wells Fargo advisor. He or she will find me. We'll get those other questions answered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.